So what is mediation? Say that I know that getting a dog has some causal effect on my happiness, but part of having a dog means walking your dog, and having more exercise has an effect on happiness. So I want to know what amount of that effect is just due to walking and what amount of it is due to other stuff related to having a dog. So I might draw a causal graph like this. And the causal effect that's not due to walking, so stuff related to having a dog that affects my happiness that's not due to walking is known as the direct effect. And the amount of happiness from having a dog that's due to walking is known as the indirect effect. So that's mediated by the mediator, the walking mediator there. So this is what mediation analysis is about. We have some potential mediator that we want to know what amount of the total causal effect is going through the mediator and what amount is not going through the mediator. For example, if all of the causal effect of getting a dog on my happiness is mediated by just walking more, then I don't really need to get a dog. I could just walk more. In other words, if the indirect effect is the total effect, then there might not be a reason to get a dog. But if there is a large direct effect here, then there might be reason to get a dog. And the phrase direct effect isn't really the best naming here, but it's commonly used, so that's why I use it here. The reason is that there are, are probably potentially many other mediators that you might be interested in. For example, if you're walking your dog, you might make more friends with people who like dogs, who walk up to you on the street and start talking to you, and that could impact your happiness. And that was all bundled up in direct effect before. And there could always just be many other mediators that are kind of bundled up in direct effect. It might make more sense to think of the direct effect as like the unmediated effect. It's the effect that isn't going through the mediators that you're analyzing. And you can think of the indirect effect as like the mediated effect. What amount of the total effect is mediated by some specific mediator of interest? Okay, so how can we measure these indirect and direct effects? We'll start with the direct effect. So you have this causal graph, and you want to measure just the flow from T to Y. You don't want to measure the causation flowing along this path going through M. What might you do? Well, you could condition on M. So you'd be looking at this quantity on the bottom here. However, conditioning isn't really optimal because conditioning on M could open up other paths. So maybe let's not just condition on M to isolate the direct effect. Really, a better choice is to actually intervene on M. So put M inside of the do operator. Because when we do M, then we remove all incoming edges to M, and then we've effectively isolated the flow of causation from T to Y in this graph. Because in this graph, after we've removed edges going into M, we have that the only causation flowing from T to Y is directly from T to Y, not through M. And this is known as the controlled direct effect because we're controlling M to be equal to some specific value, little m. But there are some problems with the controlled direct effect. The first is that this CDE is specific to the arbitrary choice of M, right? So for any different value of M here, we can get a different controlled direct effect. Ideally, we would have just one controlled direct effect. In other words, the direct effect would be one specific value, ideally. Then the second major problem is how do we get the indirect effect? So we're not just interested in the direct effect, but also the effect that goes through the mediator M. And you might think that you could subtract the controlled direct effect from the total effect to get the indirect effect. But subtracting the control direct effect from the total effect doesn't necessarily give you the indirect effect. Okay, so to solve this problem, we'll consider what's known as the natural direct effect and the corresponding natural indirect effect. First, we have to introduce this subscript notation. So we denote y given do t and m as just y with the subscript t and m. And then there's nothing special about y. We can do the same thing for the mediator. So m given do t is just m sub t. So under this new notation, we could rewrite the control direct effect that we saw in the previous slide as follows. And now we'll introduce the natural direct effect. 
So with the natural direct effect, we're still intervening on t to set it to 1 and set it to 0, and taking the difference between those two, but the difference between the natural direct effect and the controlled direct effect comes with the value that we're setting the mediator equal to. So in the natural direct effect, we're setting the mediator equal to the value that it would be under no treatment. So here we're talking about a mediator when the treatment is equal to zero. Same here. In other words, we want to know how the outcome would change when treatment is changed from zero to one when the mediator in both cases is fixed to the specific value that the mediator would be if treatment were zero. So for this expression on the right, everything seems pretty normal in that the treatment is zero here and the treatment is zero here. But for the expression on the left, it's much less normal. It's a counterfactual expression. So we're talking about the outcome under treatment one, but then we're talking about the mediator under treatment zero. So this is where the counterfactual is, right? This term is the outcome that we would observe if we take treatment, but then in this world where the mediator is intervened on to set to be equal to the value that the mediator would be if treatment were zero. So this is a direct effect because the mediator is set to the same value in both potential outcomes, while the treatment is varying across the two potential outcomes. And it's natural in the sense that the specific value that the mediator is set to is the value that it would naturally take on under no treatment. This can be a bit intuitive, especially the potential outcome on the left, since it's counterfactual. So I think it's worth kind of pausing here and thinking a bit about this to make sure this makes sense to you. So that's the natural direct effect, and then we can define the natural indirect effect very similarly. Here we want to know the effect of t on y that's going through the mediator. So the term on the right is still the same, and the term on the left is the counterfactual term, but the term on the left is different now. So because we want to know the effect going through the mediator now, we want the mediator values to be different between the two terms. That's why the first term has the mediator set to the value that it would take on if treatment were 1, and the second term has the mediator set to the value that the mediator would take on if treatment were 0. But we only want to know the effect that's going through the mediator, so we want to set the treatment to be the same value in both cases. So no treatment. So like the fact that the natural direct effect first term was counterfactual, the natural indirect effect first term is counterfactual as well, it's the value of the outcome that we would observe under treatment zero, but then in a world where the mediator is set to a value that it would take on under treatment one. Again, that might be a bit unintuitive, so I think it makes sense to pause here and just think about this a bit for yourself before moving on. Now, recall that the controlled direct effect had two problems. The first is that it had an arbitrary choice of m. And in this natural direct effect and natural indirect effect, we have these natural choices of m. So it's the value that the mediator would take on in the setting where the treatment takes on values that the treatment would normally take on. And the second problem with the controlled direct effect is that we don't know how to get an indirect effect. In other words, we didn't have a way of decomposing the total effect into the direct effect and indirect effect. Well, with the natural direct and natural indirect effects, we do have a way to decompose the total effect into the natural indirect effect and natural direct effect. Here, the natural indirect effect with this subscript R just means the reverse transition. So that means that rather than being interested in what would happen if we went from treatment 0 to treatment 1, we're interested in the other direction. If we went from treatment 1 to treatment 0. So we would take this natural indirect effect expression, and to get this sub r1, we just replace all zeros with 1s and all 1s with zeros for all of this. 
For example, in the linear setting, the reversal operator just turns into a negative and we get this very clean additive decomposition. Total effect is equal to natural direct effect plus natural indirect effect. And that brings us to our next question, which is show that the total effect decomposes as the natural direct effect minus the natural indirect effect in the reverse direction, where this is exactly what I mean by natural indirect effect in the reverse direction. It's worth recapping the strength and weaknesses of controlled direct effects and natural direct effects and comparing them on the same slide. So the great thing about controlled direct effects is they, they can always be measured via experiments. So you can denote them in terms of just the do operator. You don't need counterfactuals. But the bad thing about them is that there's no clear undirect effect, right? And there's no decomposition of the total effect into a direct effect and undirect effect in this controlled version. Whereas with natural direct effects, they can't always be measured via experiments since they're counterfactual. But the natural direct effect allows for the complete decomposition of the total effect into the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect, which is very important in mediation analysis, right? We want to be able to attribute, say, what percentage of the total effect is due to some mediator, is going through that mediator. And though natural direct effect and natural indirect effect can't always be measured via experiments or identified, they can be if we have the right causal graph. So we're now going to talk about when we can measure the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect. First, we have some adjustment set W, and we'll give you some sufficient conditions for identifying the natural direct effect, which you can then use to identify the natural indirect effect via that decomposition. The first one is that no member of W is descendant of T. The second condition is that W blocks all backdoor paths from M to Y. So if we have these two, then we have the following equation for the natural direct effect. This tells us that we can identify the natural direct effect via experiments if we have these two conditions satisfied. The reason I say via experiments is because there are many do operators in this equation, and we can have access to these interventional distributions with the do operators in them if we are doing experiments that correspond to those do operators, those interventions. But how about identifying the natural direct effect from just observational data? So can we get rid of these do operators? For example, this do operator, we're, we're jointly intervening on T and M, and then we're summing over all M. That seems like a lot of interventions. We have to intervene on M for all values of M. So how can we identify these quantities, get rid of these do operators? Well, we'll need two more assumptions. The first is that we need to be able to identify the distribution of the mediator, given that we've intervened on T and conditional on W. So for example, we can identify this distribution if there are no unblockable backdoor paths from T to M, then we would have identifiability by just the backdoor adjustment. But you could imagine more general identifiability using do calculus. And then the last condition is that we need to be able to identify the distribution of y, given that we jointly intervene on t and m, conditional on w. So for example, if we have no unblockable backdoor paths from t to y, because we're intervening on t, and because since we're also intervening on m, but we've already assumed that we have no backdoor paths from m to y, so if we have this fourth sufficient condition, then we can identify the natural direct effect using just observational data. Here we've just gotten rid of the do operators. And finally, we can use this to identify the natural indirect effect using this decomposition of the total effect. Then the final question is to come up with your own example of mediation and the corresponding causal graph. Then Using that causal graph, see whether you can identify the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect, say from observational data or experimental data, using the sufficient conditions on the last slide.
Finally, you might be interested in measuring causal effects that are flowing along arbitrary paths in the graph. So say you have this total effect of t on y, and you want to measure the effect along one path or along multiple paths, uh, but not all of the paths from t to y. These are known as path-specific effects, and if you want to learn more about this, you can go ahead and check out this Identifiability of Path-Specific Effects paper from 2005. All right, and that's the end of this course on Introduction to Causal Inference. Thanks for sticking through to the end. I hope you enjoyed it.